there's another important part of Marx's micro theory of capitalism, namely the part where he talks about exploitation and the source of injustice. In order to understand Marx's views on exploitation, we need to go back and talk about the labor theory of value and the labor theory of surplus value. Now, the labor theory of value has his roots in John Locke's theory of property and work. But Marx goes beyond John Locke's own account. Marx's theory starts with this idea of socially necessary labor time. As he defines it, socially necessary labor time is the labor time required to produce any use value. Remember that anything with utility, anything useful, has use value. So, according to Marx, it's the amount of labor time required to produce any use value under the condition of production normal for a given society and with the average degree of skill and intensity of the labor prevalent in that society. In order to get the role that this notion of socially necessary labor time plays in Marx's account and how this will kind of lead to his view about exploitation, let's consider an example. Let's say Jane and I are making an app. One of the main sort of problems of labor theories of value is that, for instance, let's say Jane is a perfectionist. She spends twice as long on making this app as I spend in making my app. But most of this perfectionism is actually in her own head because at the end of the day, the apps are going to be the same. Marx would say, in fact, he would not say that Jane's app is worth twice my app because she put twice as much labor into it. No, because according to Marx's view, half of this labor is socially unnecessary. So what matters is the socially necessary labor time. Or let's say a new labor saving device is created uh, so that I can do some of the bits of the app programming more quickly than before. And I use this tool, the labor saving device, and Jane wouldn't use it. So uh, I get to produce my app quicker. Now, her app is not going to sell for more than my app because, again, she's using socially unnecessary labor. So to repeat, the average degree of skill and intensity of labor prevalent in a society at the time is what going to determine the value of commodities. Or if you remember this term, the long term equilibrium price of a commodity, its natural value. So the notion of socially necessary labor time is important for Marx because it helps him define the natural value of commodity or their long term equilibrium price. In other words, the natural value of a commodity is going to be determined by the amount of labor power that is socially necessary to produce it. This idea of socially necessary includes everybody working at the same or an average intensity, and it includes using available technologies because if some use them and others don't, those who don't are going to be deploying unnecessary labor time. That's not going to be reflected, according to Marx, in the value of the product because in a competitive market, the most cheaply priced commodity is going to beat the others out. It's important here to keep in mind that Marx is working in his theory with a model of a perfectly competitive economy in which equivalents are exchanged for equivalents. There is no cheating. He works with this model at least in the beginning. He's going to have a view about how economies evolve over time to become uncompetitive. But initially, in his analytic story, in a competitive economy, the most cheaply produced products are going to drive out the less cheaply produced one. That is why it's socially necessary labor time, not actual labor time that matters in determining the natural value of a commodity or a product. So this is the labor theory of value. Now, that's not the whole story. We need also to look at the labor theory of surplus value. Marx wants to say something like, 
living human labor power is the only source of fresh value, of exchange value. So he claims that all exchange value comes from human work. This idea that living human labor power is the only source of fresh exchange value is based on two other assumptions or ideas Marx has. One, he claims that if you look at all the commodities that are produced in the market economy, the one thing they all have in common is that they are products of human work. So he claims that living human labor power is the common denominator for all other commodities. So for instance, if we say, what is the value of a book? The value of a book is determined by the amount of labor power necessary to produce that book. When we say, what's the value of a steel worker? For Marx, this is determined by the amount of labor power necessary to produce the steel worker. The worker, remember, in Marx's theory, is also a commodity in, sa in the same way in which the book is a commodity. That is why the value of a worker is determined in a similar way as the value of a, any other commodity is a book. But this doesn't cancel the fact that for Marx, human labor power is the common denominator is necessary for producing any other type of commodity. Because of this first idea, for Marx, wages are determined by the cost of producing the worker. The reason a physicist gets paid more than a manual laborer is simple for Marx. It costs more to produce the physicist than it costs to produce the manual laborer. All the training and education and so on that goes into the physicist costs more than the training and education that goes into producing the manual laborer. So for Marx, wages are not explained by the value of what the worker produces. This is one thing that people often get wrong about Marxian um, micro theory. For him, values are explained by the cost of producing the worker. And it's worth repeating. Uh, that wages are explained not by the value of what the worker produces, but rather by the cost of producing the worker. So to recap the first point I made, labor power is a commodity and its exchange value or its price is determined by what it costs to produce it. But remember I said Marx wants to say more. He wants to say that living human labor power is a unique commodity in that its consumption as a use value leads to creation of fresh exchange value. Let's take another example to explain this idea. Let's suppose I have some money and I spend that money on a wonderful meal and good wine. At the end, the meal is gone. I pay and it's gone. I've consumed it. Whereas if I had spent the money hiring someone to paint one wall in my home, let's say, when this is done, my home's worth something more. Some fresh exchange value has been created because if I decide to sell my home, now it's going to be worth more than before I invested in the painter. So you have something of greater value in the second scenario. You have a house that's worth more than it was before you hired this person to paint it. That's what makes labor power unique, according to Marx. Before moving from these two components of the labor theory of value, the labor theory of value and the labor theory of surplus value, I want to clarify a couple more terms that Marx is using in talking about exploitation and the source of injustice. It is worth insisting on these distinctions because the way Marx understood the, these terms is quite different from the way in which uh, modern economists um, are defining these terms. So his language is, in a sense, somewhat archaic. For instance, like when he makes the distinction between constant capital and variable capital. Capital is what the capitalist spends in the productive process. Variable capital is wages. Constant capital is everything else. The rent it pays, investments in technology, the profit, and so on. 
Variable capital sometimes is, you will see in this capital is um, marked with V, a constant capital with a small c. And together, constant capital and variable capital are make what the capitalist um, expense in the productive process, and that's capital with a big C. Why does he call wages variable capital? This is related to his ideas that wages are always driven towards subsistence. This is one empirical assumption that Marx makes uh, and one that's actually the most accurate. He wants to say that there are always some unemployed in capitalist economies. And because there are always some unemployed in capitalist economies, wages will be driven towards subsistence. Because if you say have a union that organizes and drives up wages, the employer will then go and hire non-union workers and say, will you work for me? It's something lower than what the union uh, prom promises as a wage. The answer will be yes, because the unemployed worker won't have a choice. So wages will be driven towards subsistence. Well, you might ask, what is subsistence? Marx claims that subsistence has a social and a historical element. That is, in a society like ours, the definition of subsistence might include things like um, the ability to buy a car in order to drive, drive to work. Whereas, obviously, in the 19th century, um, this wasn't the case. So what counts as subsistence changes historically. Marx acknowledges that there's actually a drive for what counts as subsistence to go up. At any given time, there will be an acceptable level of subsistence and the wages will be driven towards it because of the existence of what he calls as the reserve army of the unemployed. The unemployed is what keeps the wages of subsistence or close to it in a com competitive economy. So, what does Marx have to say about exploitation? And how does it relate to his views of surplus value and how uh, the labor theory of value uh, can explain the creation of surplus value. Remember, an important point that Marx wanted to make is that only living human labor power can be the source of fresh exchange value. This is going to matter for how he technically defines the notion of exploitation. So let's suppose there's a working day and suppose the accepted working day is 10 hours long. Now, Marx wants to say that if we think about what the worker is doing, like producing some commodity, for some portion of the working day, the commodity uh, is being produced, and when it's eventually sold, it's going to cover the cost of his wages. So, the worker produces some commodity all day long, and the capitalist eventually sells the commodity and gets something for it, and then he's got to pay the worker his wage. Let's say for the purpose of this example that the work that's done in the first four hours is going to cover the wage bill and the rest is what Marx calls surplus. So we have a difference between necessary and surplus labor time. Marx uses this sort of difference to define technically the notion of a rate of exploitation as the ratio of necessary to surplus labor time. Let's say in our example, this is 1.5. The necessary uh, labor time is the value that covers the wage bill. And the surplus one is the rest. One might ask, is the rest profit? Marx says the rest is not profit. So the rate of exploitation for him is not the same as the rate of profit. You might ask, why not? Because the capitalist has to use this rest to do more than just collect the profit, has to buy raw material, has to do the advertising, has to have a system of managers, research and development, and all of that has to be paid out out of this rest value. So profit is a subset of the rest value, but it's not all of it. For Marx, exploitation is not about cheating people. It's not about getting people to do things involuntarily. The idea behind Marx's view of exploitation 
is remember that everything happens in a perfectly competitive economy where equivalent is exchanged for equivalent. Use value is voluntarily exchanged. So then you might say, so where does this exploitation come from? In a way, the notion that Marx proposes is quite counterintuitive because Marx claimed that the only way in which the capitalist can increase his productivity is by either increasing the absolute surplus value or increasing relative surplus value. So he has this further distinction in surplus value between absolute surplus value and relative surplus value. Absolute surplus value is basically lengthening the working day, getting people to work harder. There are obviously physical limits to that and also political limits. So people can pass something like the 10 hours bill through parliament, which they actually did in the 19th century. So that is going to limit how much the capitalism can get the production to be more productive via uh, this mechanism. If absolute surplus value can be increased only by lengthening the working day, the relative surplus value uh, can be increased by technological innovation so that the capitalism can cover the wage bill in less time. So the necessary labor time goes from four hours to three uh, and there's going to be in our example, seven hours of surplus labor time where the workers are producing the commodities or the goods and then sold, produce value that's not accrued to them. So technological innovation can make the social and necessary labor time to, be, uh, to decrease, to be even smaller. So the surplus labor time is going to increase and that's going to create more value for the capitalist that's not accrued to the worker. It is this kind of move, increasing productivity by technological innovation, that Marx and modern economists all agree is the thing that makes capitalism dynamically productive. Because it's the pressure to innovate that's created by capitalist competition that leads to technological innovation and more and more capital intensive production. If you think about it, the more you spend on technology to make your labor more productive, the less you're spending on your wage bill. And it's only living human labor power that creates fresh value, according to Marx. So if you think in, on Marx's schema, we think about production becoming more and more capital intensive because of technological innovation. More and more is spent on technology to make the workers more productive. So capital intensity increases over time. One might say, OK, what does this all have to do with exploitation? Marx claims that out of these calculations, taking into account the ways in which the capitalism can increase surplus value by technological innovation, comes an objective notion of exploitation, not a normative notion. The fact that people don't feel more exploited in the circumstances um, in which technological innovation uh, increases doesn't matter. It is true in the sense of class in itself sense of Marx that they are more exploited. So to repeat, the rate of exploitation is not the rate of profit. It's not the rate of profit, remember, because the value that's created, the so-called variable capital, which is the wage bill, is separated out from the rest of the capital. So the capitalist profit comes from the rest, as I said, but he or she also have to pay rent, research, development costs, advertising, you name it. So profit is some subset of this. The rate of profit is not the same thing as the rate of exploitation or the rate of surplus value. What Marx is assuming in his technical notion of exploitation is that the worker is producing some value that ultimately accrues to the capitalist. And he can show that kind of mathematically by showing that there is this surplus value kind of created. This is what he um, thinks is the objective notion of exploitation as it appears in a capitalist system. <music> <music>